concerned about and the jury. Well, I meant the cyber. Oh, the cyber. Yeah, I'm not here to sit here and say. All right. Anything else we need to address before we bring in the jury? No, no. All right. Soon we're also going to want to line up and ready to go. Before we start, Judge? Yes.
Well, President Council Judge Fox, please. Take the entire chair over here. All right, Mr. Rivera, you're Mr. Florida, aren't you? I'm Mr. Florida. Yeah, you're the Mr. Florida who's on the phone records for 2216? No, I actually brought that phone for a friend of mine. So you bought the phone for a friend of yours, but you were using it for days, including the night Sean Taylor was killed? Yes, I was using it. So that's a phone you regularly used, is that right? Yes, it was my phone at the time. So you got the phone, is that right? Yes, I brought it. So you got it under the name Mr. Florida. That's where we began this discussion. Yes. And you're the one who provided the address and the date of birth. Yes. Which are actually not completely accurate. No, it's my friend address. Oh, right. So it's my friend address and date of birth. All right. So you entered into a contract for the phone. Is that right? Yeah, I brought the phone. Yes. And then you put a fake name on it and a different app. Sure. You've been using that phone for a long time, hadn't you? Yes, I use it. And that's the phone and the phone number that your father would have had for you? Yes. You were a football player? Yes, I played football. You must have been in good shape? In good shape? Yeah. I was in, I was in fair shape. I was in shape, yes. You were a quarterback? Yes, I played quarterback. Is that a leadership position? Is it a leadership? Yes. On the football field? Yes. Yes, I guess. You said you had uh, a friend named Trey. Trey, yes. That's Trenicia Bowman? Yes. And that's her phone number on the records that end in 7795? Uh, I'm not sure. Trenicia Bowman is the girl that you were calling, is that right? Did I call her that night? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I called her.
to show you something, see if it will help you refresh your recollection about your girlfriend's phone number. This is, yeah. this is marked for identification exhibit 6G. 6G. Judge, unfortunately, we're going to need to approach that. Rivera, I'd like you to take a look at setting page number 6G, which is a Metro PCS subscriber information telephone record. Does that refresh your recollection? Now, Trini Shia Bowman, you know that person, don't you? Yes, I know she is. In terms of the phone number and the date of activation, does that help you to remember what the phone number was? I mean, not really, no. You say a, that's a number. That's a number that you were dialing the night that Shaq Taylor was killed. Objection. He's testifying, Judge. He just said he doesn't remember. It didn't help him. <laughs> so you recognize the name Trinicia Bowman, don't you? Yes. And your phone records are the phone records for 2216, right? I believe so, yes. And I'm showing you what is moved in evidence of state exhibit number 84. Do you see these records? Yes. You can see telephone number uh, calls to 7795, can't you? 745-7795? Yes, I see the number. So those are phone calls that were going back and forth between you and that telephone number that night. That's a friend of yours, isn't it? Yes, he's a friend of mine. And you were calling her that night, weren't you? <clears throat> yeah, I'm pretty sure I called her. Okay. Now, you said that Jason Mitchell was not a friend of yours. No. So that's not a person that you hung out with? No. Is that a person that you ever talked to? No. So it was unusual for you to see him late that night? Was it unusual? Yeah. Yeah. First time ever? First time ever. Okay. Let's talk about the uh, night Sean Taylor was killed. But before we do that, you told the jury earlier that when you talked to the police, the Miami-Dade Police Department, and you gave a sworn statement that some of that statement was lies. Is that right? Some of it was lies? Yeah. Yeah, some of it. All right. So... You would agree then that you would lie under oath if you think that it would help you or someone close to you. Is that right? Would I lie under oath if I think it would help somebody? Yeah. Yeah, I would. And you're on trial for first degree murder, aren't you? Objection. And you've already told the jury, have you not, that when you've been in court before in a proceeding that we will talk about in more detail, that you said something that wasn't true, that you lied, right? Yes. So you lied to the Miami-Dade Police Department under oath, and you've lied in court before under oath. Is that right? Yes. Let's talk about uh, the day that Sean Taylor was killed. You're at Trinicia Bowman's at what time? Um, between 7 and 8 and 10, 10.30. You had your phone. I had my phone. Yeah. Yeah, I had my phone. You had 200 bucks in your pocket, right? Probably. She had a phone. 
the Seattle phone. And you could have gone anywhere that you wanted at that point in time, couldn't you? At that point? Sure. Could I have gone anywhere? You could have gone anywhere you wanted at that point. You had money, you could call a cab, right? Never called the cab before. You were 17 years old and eight months. Did you know what a cab was? Did I know what a cab was? Yes. Yeah, of course I knew what a cab was. So you say you called your home at 9.43, is that right, roughly? Yeah, roughly, yeah. You had your keys with you. Yes, I had keys. You could have called a cab and gone home, right? Yeah, I guess I could have, yes. You talked to your sister, so your sister was home. Yes, yeah, she was home. Charles Wardlow is your best friend. We're close friends. I got a lot of close friends. He's your blood relative. Charles Wardlow? Yeah. No, I'm not getting to him. Excuse me? There's no blood relations. You treat him like he's your cousin, don't you? I treat him? Yeah. I treat him as if he's a friend. All right. How far were you from your home at Trenisha Bowman's? Um, I don't know. It's a different section, different section of the county. 10 or 15 minutes? 10 to 15 minutes? Yeah. I guess it depends on the traffic. All right. So your friend, your very good friend, Charles Wardlow, had a car, right? Yes. By the time you got into that car and started participating in discussions inside the car, you knew they were going to plan and commit an armed burglary, right? Did I know they planned it? Yeah, you told us earlier that they talked about it in front of you, didn't you? At what time? Well, when did they start talking about it in front of you? Well, the first time I heard something about Miami was when he came like the trade house a little early and you know, asked me if I'm ready to leave. So that was at what time? Probably like 30 minutes, an hour before I finally left. All right, so that could have been around what, 8 o'clock at night? Eight. Yeah. Uh, probably more around nine thirty ten. All right. So by nine thirty or ten, you knew they were going to Miami, right? Yes, I knew he wanted to go to Miami. And not long after that, you knew they were going to commit an armed burglary, right? Yes, I found out. So why didn't you just ask your very good friend Charles Wardlow to drive? 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, out of his busy schedule before a two and one half hour drive to Miami to drop you off at your house where you knew your sister was home and you had a kid. Huh? We had the conversation. I told him to take me home. So you're saying that your very good friend, Charles Wardlow, for whom you stated earlier you were willing to lie under oath in court. That you, he wouldn't give you a ride home that would have taken him 10 minutes. It would have taken him 10 minutes? Yes. I'm not sure how long it would have took him, but that was the conversation, yes. You went with him because you were a part of the plan. It was never no plan, as far as I knew. You knew by the time you were in the car, even accepting what your testimony is here today. I knew by the time I was in the car? Yes. What's time? You knew by the time you left uh, your girlfriend's house, didn't you? No, I didn't know that. I didn't know he wanted to go to Miami. Shortly after being in that car, you knew you were on your way to Miami to go to the home of Sean Taylor and burglarize it, didn't you? Shortly after I was in the car? Yeah. Did I know? No, I didn't really know at that time the details. You knew they were go Didn't you testify earlier that you knew they were going to go to the home of Sean Taylor and burglarize it? Yes, I found that out at one point. You could have gotten out of the car. I could have got out of the car. Sure. At that point, you could have had your very good friend Charles Wardlow drop you at a gas station, right? I could have had him drop me off at a gas station. You could have had him drop you off at a gas station, right? I guess it's possible. Yes. You stopped at gas stations, didn't you? Yes, we stopped at gas stations. You could have gotten off at a gas station if you weren't a participant in the crime, right? 
Right, yes. Excuse me? Yes. You could have gotten off at any of their stops, or you could have asked them to simply pull over on the way to the highway or at any place that they stopped or after they got off of the highway, but you didn't do that, did you? No. And to go back again, you knew fairly early on that you were going to the home of Sean Taylor, didn't you? Did I know early on? Yeah. What time? You certainly knew within a little while after you were in that car at the latest, didn't you? I found out while I was in the car, yes. You knew who Sean Taylor was, right? Yes, I knew he was. But you stayed in the car anyway? Yes, I stayed in the car. And you knew those people were going to steal from him, right? Yes. And you were one of those people, weren't you? Was I one of the people? That's right. That I was going to steal from him? That's right. No, I wasn't. You know, we saw a picture, of, uh, a nice picture of you and your family earlier. It is defense exhibit number E. You remember this, don't you? Yes. But that night, you were with Ben Jahan, right? That night, yes. Your very good friend, Charles Wardlow. Yes. You were with Jason Mitchell, who you say you had nothing to do with really before that night. Is that right? Yes. You were with Tim Brown. Yes. And this is you that night. Yes. So that's the group of people. Those are the photographs of the people that you were with that night when you went to the home of Sean Taylor and he was killed, correct? Yes, we all was in the car. You knew there was a gun in the car? Yes, I knew. You knew what kind of gun it was? I knew what kind of gun it was? Yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah, I knew. And that black car, you'd seen that black car before, hadn't you? Yes. How many times had you seen the black car before that? The rental car? Yeah. Probably seen it almost every day. You were at the Hertz rental, weren't you? Yes, I was there. So you're in the car, you're headed to Miami, you know they've got a gun, and they're going to go into the home of some people who live there with him, right? I knew that I was going to go to the home of some people that lived there with him. Yes, you knew that these people, your friends, the people in the car with you, although you say you're not friends with Jason Mitchell. I'm we're not going friends to Sean with Jason, Taylor. I've been to our Okay, but you wind up in a car with them where they're going to go to commit an armed burglary and they're not uncomfortable with you in the car, right? They're not uncomfortable? I'll ask it a different way. They didn't ask you to leave the car, did they? They didn't really say nothing to me. So they're talking about committing an armed burglary of the home of the National Football League player and getting a large sum of money right in front of you, right? Yes. And you're saying that uh, they don't know one way or the other whether you're going to get out and call the police if you're not involved, right? All right, so they're talking about all these things all the way down to Miami, which is a two and a half hour ride, right? Depending on the traffic. Well, what was it that night? You were there. You remember everything. How was the traffic? Yeah. I guess there wasn't really no traffic. So how long did it take you to get there? Um, probably two hours or so. All right. So for the two hours that you're going down there, they're talking about going to Sean Taylor's home, aren't they? The whole two hours? Most of it. Basically, yeah. And your testimony is everyone in the car except you who are on trial and your very good friend Charles Wardlow were the only ones committing the crime. Is that right? No room. Excuse me? Yeah. You're saying that there's five people in the car and you and your very good friend Charles Wardlow are the only ones not involved in the crime. Is that what you're saying? Not involved? Uh, I can't really say if Charles was involved or not. So was Charles involved? He, was he in the planning to go down there? Was he in the plan? Sure. Was he talking about planning to go down to Sean Taylor's house that night? 
in a car with you. He talked about all his other conversations in the car with his co-defendant. So was Charles Wardlow participating in the discussions uh, about the burglary of Sean Taylor's house? It wasn't, I guess, by the time I got in the car, it was already decided upon. I'm asking you, was Charles Wardlow participating in the discussions to go and commit the burglary at Sean Taylor's house? Yes or no? He had conversations, yes. So then you're the only one, you're okay. saying, who didn't participate in the discussions on the way down? Participate in the discussions? Yeah. No, I had nothing to do with it. You're on the way down there. Did you ask for a little bit of the money? Did I ask for a little bit of money? Yeah. No, for what? For the burglary that you were driving down to Miami with other people in the car to commit. Yes, I never really said nothing. I had no, I don't know. I guess I wasn't thinking, but. So you're in a black car that goes all the way down to Miami, right? Yes. And it sits out. Jason Mitchell is talking to someone on the phone? Yes, at one point. All right. Do you know who he was, ta who he was talking to? No, I don't know who he was talking to. So he's trying to get directions. I believe he was getting directions. Is he getting directions to Sean Taylor's house or the general area? Well, later I found out he was getting directions to the house. All right, who's he getting them from? I don't know. So you wind up outside of Sean Taylor's house and everyone's talking about going in to burglarize the house, right? Everyone's talking about going in? Yeah. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Well, who was talking about it? Who was talking about it? At first, it was just Jason saying he was going to go in. Then Vendor said he was going to go in with him. Then that's when Tim Tim said he was going to go. But Vendor started like, it was basically a conversation. Vendor was telling Tim to just stay in the car. But Tim was like, man, I'm going. And it's basically, they went back and forth for a minute. Now, that's the Jason that you really haven't talked to before. Is that right? Jason? Yeah, Jason Mitchell. I don't believe I never spoke to Jason before. All right, so before you got in the car with him, you never spoke with him? I don't believe, no. I think I spoke to his brother before, but I never spoke to him. Then why are there so many of his calls on your cell phone records? Speculation? Yeah, speculation? State Exhibit Number 85, the telephone records of Jason Mitchell. You've seen that number before, haven't you? Jason's number? Yeah. I don't know Jason's number. 239-645-8253. I don't recall the number. I don't know his number. Let's look back at your phone records. November the 25th, 903. I'm looking at his records that are in evidence. Sidebar records? I'm looking at his records of everyone in evidence. Ask him, you said no speaking of questions, so I want to be There are calls back and forth between you and Jason Mitchell that night, aren't there? Me and Jason? Yeah. What time? Well, there's one right there at 2103 hours. That's 903. 2103? He's never established that Jason Mitchell's number. That's Jason Mitchell's number, isn't it? That's his number? Mr. Rude, witness, or is Mr. Rude? I don't know. There are a number of calls between you Judge and 239. What's going on here? You saw these records. You had an opportunity to review these records last night, didn't you? Did I look at them? Yes, you did look at them, didn't you? Yes, I looked at them. And so you know that there are calls from Jason Mitchell's phone back and forth to your phone. I'll put it up on the Elmo, one example of that. 
jury is the witness of the jury. I'm showing to the jury right now, counsel. You can see that. So we're going to close the argument? No, but I've got a court report, so I don't need all the other annotations either. Mr. Brown. So he was calling you, wasn't he? Jason was calling me? Yeah. Jason never called me. He never called you, even though his cell phone is on your Metro PCS phone records? I mean, I never spoke to him. Here's another call. Eighteen fifty-six. He's calling you. He's calling your number. He's called me. Well, actually, I stand corrected. You're calling him. Did I speak? I didn't call him. That's what I'm trying to tell you. The caller ID for you is off to the right. Eighteen fifty-six. Off to the left is 8253. Off to the right. There's a caller ID number. Nineteen oh two fifty eight. Nineteen oh two fourteen. Eighteen fifty six oh three. Eighteen fifty six thirty five. That's three. And we talked about one or two from the other page, right? I don't know. Then as we go down towards the bottom, there are a number of calls that pop up. Two three nine six four five eight two five three. So all these calls from somebody you don't know, who's planning to go to the home of Sean Taylor, who's been there before. It to depends steal on what time it is. They probably Charles probably using my phone. What I'm telling you is, I never called Jason. I never spoke to Jason. Hey, I wasn't friends with Jason. Charles had his own phone. It's picked up on the cell site records. You've been here uh, sitting through the trial. You listened to the testimony of Mr. Thompson, didn't you? Yes, I heard. Charles was using his own phone all night. Charles? Yeah. I mean, he probably was using my phone too because I know at one point he was trying to get in contact with Jason, but Jason wasn't answering the phone for him. I thought you were sitting at the uh, house at Trinitia Bowman earlier that night. Between, say, seven and eight. Between seven and eight? Yeah, seven and nine. I mean, I went to our house all around that time. All right, so you're down at the home of Sean Taylor, and you know these people are about to go in and commit an armed burglary, right? Yes. So they leave, and they leave with a gun, right? Yes. Now, you knew who Sean Taylor was, right? Yes, I knew he was. You knew people were going into his home at 1.30, 1.40 in the morning, right? Yes. Did you take your phone and call the police? Did I take my phone and call the police? That's right. No. Did you borrow Charles' phone and call the police? No. They left the keys in the ignition? They left the keys in the ignition. Yeah. Yeah, the car never was turned off. So you're sitting in the car in the front passenger seat, right? 
Yes. Is Charles asleep in the back? No, not at that time. Is he in the second row or the third row? Well, when we got to the house, he got in the driver's seat. All right, so you and Charles are sitting there watching with the keys in the ignition while, according to you, only three people went into the house to commit an armed burglary. Is that it? Well, watching, we were sitting in the car, yes. Why didn't you leave? Why did I leave? That's right. Why didn't you say, Charles, um, we got a car, we've got phones, I've got $200, let's get out of here. We're not a part of this. Why didn't you do that? I mean, it's his car. I'm going to tell him what to do. Well, you drove the car later that night, didn't you? Did I drive it? Yeah. That morning, yeah, I drove it. All right, so you wouldn't hesitate to drive the car if you felt like it or it was convenient for you, right? I wouldn't hesitate to drive it. That's right. I mean, if he told me I could drive it, no, I wouldn't. Well, you did drive it later, right? Yes, I drove it. So you could have driven it then? Could I drive it then? Precisely. I mean, what do you mean, could I drive it? Yeah, I could have driven it, yes. All right. Well, why didn't you do it? I don't know. I never thought about doing it. So while these men are inside the house according to you, and you're waiting outside according to you, you never thought about leaving? I never thought about leaving? No. No, I never thought about leaving. So you're just sitting there watching? Watching what? Watching everything. I wasn't watching anything. So you say they came back to the car? Yes, they eventually they came back. And they thought they heard people inside? Yes, I believe it was Benjamin. Uh, Jason thought he heard somebody. You never said leave. Did I say leave? You never said leave, did you? No, Charles did. I didn't say nothing. Why didn't you leave? Why didn't I leave? Yeah, why didn't you leave when they went back inside the house, according to you? I mean, I was in the car at all. If he left, if I left. Were you just sitting there watching while your friends were inside the house, according to you? Who were my friends? My friends was inside the house. I'm talking about the three people who were willing to have you sitting in a car with the keys in the ignition while they're inside a house uh, two and a half hours from home committing an armed burglary. Those are the people I'm talking about. Next So how many gunshots did you hear? How many gunshots did I hear? Yes. I didn't hear gunshots. So you never heard a gunshot? No, I did. You're sitting right outside of Sean Taylor's house. There are two there are two gunshots and you never heard one of them. Is that right? Right, I didn't hear gunshots. You didn't hear the glass shattering? No. So these people come running back to the car. Yes. And you all take off. Yes. And you go all the way back to Miami. Back to Miami? Yeah. There are stops along the way, aren't there? Along the way to yeah. Fort did Myers? You yeah, did you, I beg your pardon, all the way back to Fort Myers. Did you, uh, didn't they stop for gas? No, they didn't stop for gas because I wouldn't give them no gas money. So they never stopped between Miami and Ariel Boston's house? Stop. Yeah, they eventually stopped on um, Alligator Alley. Did they stop again before you got to Ariel Boston's house? Uh, no. When those people got out of the car, were they wearing gloves? Were they wearing gloves? Yeah. Uh, I believe Jason had on gloves. Did you see anyone else with gloves? Anyone else? Not that I recall. Did you see any masks? Ski masks? Yeah, ski masks. They had ski masks, but they didn't wear them. So they brought ski masks all the way down there, including Jason, who'd been in the house before and he didn't wear one. No. By the way, before they went back in the house, was there some discussion uh, about what they would do if they found someone inside? Wasn't there some talk about that? Did they found someone? Yeah. 
No, we basically not. discussed that. Tim said, hey, that was my voice. Excuse me? Basically, Tim convinced them that it was him. He was saying that was me. Wasn't there talk before the second time they went in about what they would do to the people if they found them inside? What they would do with the people? Yeah, that they would lay them down? <laughs> no. All right, so you go back to Ariel Boston's house, and you go into Ariel Boston's house with these people, right? When I go back to Ariel Boston's house? Yeah, you went back to Ariel Boston's house with Venja and Tim and Jason and Charles. Yeah, we went to our house, yes. And this was after you knew that someone had been shot inside the house, right? Yes, I knew someone was shot. And what were you doing in Ariel Boston's house then? What I was doing? Yeah. I wasn't doing nothing. It's just when we first went, that's when I went and got gas and got something to eat, and I came back. So you came back for them again, knowing that they uh, committed an armed burglary? I came back for them. Isn't that what you just told us? I mean, I came back, yes. It was Charles' car, so... You had the car then. You could have driven any place that you wanted to. Then? I said you had the according to your testimony, you had the car then you could have driven any place that you wanted to. Right? Yeah, I could have took off and went anywhere. Say that again? I could have just took off and just But you didn't do that. Down. You came back for Benja Hunt and Charles Wardlow and Tim Brown and Jason Mitchell, didn't you? I wouldn't say I came back for them, but in Charles' car, I wasn't gonna just take his car. You'd rather come back and pick up the people who committed an armed burglary at Sean Taylor's house than take your friend Charles' car. Is that and right? Take my friend Charles' car? I didn't come back to pick them up. I just came back. There was nowhere else to go at that time of night. So The tools came from your yard, didn't they? The tools? That's right. Yes, they came from my yard. Well, that night, or the day before, I don't know. So they come back to Ariel Boston's house with the tools that they broke into Sean Taylor's house with, correct? They come back to Ariel's house? Yeah. You know, Ben Jahunt, Tim Brown, Jason Mitchell, Charles Wardlow, and you. Now what about the tools? They came back with the tools. You yes, know. they still had the tools. Right, the tools from your yard, right? Yes, they are Charles' tools. He had them, yes. I said, now they're Charles' tools. He always was here. Is that what you told the police in your sworn statement? No. I don't recall. You said they were your tools from your yard. Isn't that what you told the police that day? I told them it was mine. Didn't you? Possible. Excuse me? I said it's possible. So if you did that, you did it under oath, right? If I did, I did under oath? Yeah. If this in a sworn statement, yes. And if so, that would be a lie, right? According to what you just said. Yes. But the tools were from the back of your yard, right? Yes, those in the backyard. Well, kind of on the side. And Charles is the one who pried the door open in the back of Sean Taylor's house, wasn't he? Charles? Yeah. From my understanding, I believe it was Jason. Could it have been Charles? Could it have been? Sure. It could have been, couldn't it? <laughs> no. Why not? Charles never got out of the car. Well, he never jumped the gate. Go ahead. No, he never jumped the gate. He never jumped the gate. So why did you tell the police then that your good friend Charles is the one who, on page four, exact line. Why did you tell the police on page 12 of your statement that Charles is the one who broke into the back of Sean Taylor's house? Because that's what they showed me on the diagram and what he had on his notepad, what he was saying happened. You drew the diagram. I drew the diagram? You know very well that you drew the diagram. Yes, eventually, yes, I drew a diagram. You drew all of the diagram, didn't you? All of it? Yeah. Or the one you have, yes. With your own hand? 
Yes. By 215. By 215? Yeah, 215 on the day that you were arrested. Yes. So people did burn shoes that day, right? Yes, people burnt shoes. Your Air Jordans, where are they? Where they at now? Yeah. Uh, the ones you say you were wearing. I don't, I don't know. Probably still in the closet. So you say that you called your cousin that night, Jairus? Did I call him that night? Yeah, Jairus. Yes, I called him that night. That's Jairus Price? Yes. That's the same one you wrote the letter to? Yes. You told your uh, cousin what happened, didn't you? Did I tell him what happened? Yes. What do you mean what happened? Did you tell him that you were at the home of Sean Taylor when he was shot and killed? <laughs> no, I didn't tell him that. But you talked to him that night, right? Yeah, I talked to him that night. That's right. You said on a phone conversation? Anytime. On a phone conversation? Anytime. I just told him, hey, I might need you to come pick me up. Why didn't you call him earlier, say around 10? Why well, didn't call him around 10? Yeah. Yeah, I didn't think about it. He's got a car? The, at the time, he didn't own the car, but he what? used to have access to it. All right, so there's point. another person you could have called at 943 to ask to pick you up if you didn't actually want to go to Sean Taylor's house to get some of the money out of the house, correct? If I didn't want to go and get some of the money out of the house? It's a simple question. You could have called your cousin, Jairus Bryce, that you called later. Mr. Rivera, how far did you go in school? How far? Yeah. I was in the 12th grade. All right. You could have called Jairus Bryce at 9.43 from Tranicia Bowman's house to pick you up, couldn't you? I could have attempted to, yes. You actually uh, got in contact with your sister, right? Yes, I spoke to her. You could have asked to speak with your mother and father Sunday night at 9.43, couldn't you? Yes, I could have. But you chose not to do that. You made that decision, right? Yes, I chose not to bother them. Just as you chose, according to you, not to call Jairus Bryce or make any other effort to avoid being in Miami when Sean Taylor's house was burglarized, right? Yes. Did you tell uh, Jeremy Gabriel what happened at Sean Taylor's house? No. So you eventually wind up back in your house, right? Yes. The next day. And... A couple of days go by until you're in and out of your house one day on November the 30th. Is that right? Uh, yes. Now, you were late. if you were going to school at all, you were late for school, right? Was I late? Yeah, I ran a little late. Yeah, if you were going at all, you were late. Right? Yes, I was running a little late. And you were only in your house for a couple of minutes, according to you, correct? Yes. You had your cell phone. At the time, my cell phone was dead. What? My cell phone was dead. Dead? That yes, says. All right, so you went back and got a charger, and then your cell phone was operational by the time you left uh, your house on the morning of November the 30th, wasn't it? Yeah, I put it on the charger. I ran in and put it on the charger when I first went in there. Did it work or not by the time you left? Did it work? Did it work or not by the time you left your house? Yes, it worked. So you leave your house, you're in the front passenger seat, your cousin uh, Gabriel is driving, and then Devon Mays and your good, very good friend Charles Wardlow are in the back, right? Yes. When the police begin what you believe to be a routine traffic stop, right? Yes. So they stop the car, they go to one, the driver's license and tag, right? That's what I assumed they were doing. Then, earlier, you said the driver was asked to exit the car, right? Yes. So you're still sitting in the car? Yes. Everyone else is still sitting in the car? Yes. Is the driver's door closed? Was it closed? Yeah. Uh, I really don't recall. I think they closed it, yes. All right, so all the doors are closed, right? Yes. 
then Officer Olson asks you to step out. He right. asked me to step out? That's right. No, at the time I seen him placing Jeremy in the police car, that's when I asked him what was going on. And that's when he first started speaking to me. Okay. Was he talking to you about football in the beginning? No. Did he ask you to step out of the car? He asked. Yes. Yeah, he asked. Did you step out of the car? Yes. Now, you say that he took your cell phone? Yes, he took it when he opened the door. And you said earlier that you saw it again with Officer Gonzalez at the police at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Is that right? Yes. Did you see it again after that? Did I see it again after that? Yes. I seen Gonzalez give it to Segovia. All right. And then what happened to it? I guess Segovia put it in his pocket. He had. All right. Did you ever see it again? Did I see it later that night? Yeah. Early the next morning, so um, around that time, yes, I seen it again. Where'd you see it? They actually gave it back to me. You reviewed the telephone records last night, didn't you? Did I review them? Yeah, the ones that we talked about earlier. I looked at them, but I ain't really like. And so when you minutes. looked at them. You must have seen that at 10 o'clock at night, roughly, you were making telephone calls with your cell phone. I mean, when I looked at the phone records, I was looking to see if I could recall any of the numbers. That's what I was looking for, so I wasn't Did, really looking. Didn't you see that on November the 30th, at around 10 o'clock at night, you were making calls from your cell phone again? You know, the night that uh, the police took a statement from you. I mean, I don't, I don't recall seeing it. For example, turning to page 74 of uh, State Exhibit 84, you called your parents' house at 2229, didn't you? 2229? Yeah, right where the post is. I guess they are. And so before you gave your sworn, you uh, looked and reviewed at your sworn statement, you called and had an opportunity to talk with your family again after your father had come and gone, right? After he come and gone? Yes, your father had come and gone at around 5, 6 o'clock at night, right? Yes, I had opportunities. All right, and so you got your phone. And you're calling back to your parents' house again, aren't you? Yes, I'm pretty sure I called them when I got the phone. And you're calling to that same 7795 number and talking for 40 minutes that night, aren't you? Uh, yes, yes. You see that, don't you? Yes, I see it. Now, you gave testimony at a hearing on June the 9th of 2011, didn't you? Yes. It was in a courtroom like this, but on the second floor, right? Uh, I believe so, yes. Judge Murphy was there, right? Yes. Your lawyer was there? At the time, yes. And you were asked about your telephone under oath, weren't you? I was asked about the telephone? Yes. Maybe, yes. Or didn't you say under oath then we that once the... Page 145. You were asked about what became of your cell phone, weren't you? What became of it? That's right. I don't know if it was possible. Didn't you say the police took it and you never saw it again? Does the 
how we call it. Excuse me, counsel. You're not testifying now. Can we hear the next question? I got the right to do it. Isn't it true that you said that the police took your phone and you never saw it again once Officer Olson had taken it that you had discussed previously? Could he see the transcript, Judge? Sure, I'll give him a copy. Give him a copy. Thanks, Judge. Thank you. 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 Thank you
right? No, not at that point, no. And you got to the room, and the police said to you, before they can talk with you, they want to read you your Miranda rights, correct? That's really, that's not the exact words, but that's basically what they're saying. And they did, they did read you your Miranda rights, didn't they? Yes. And you knew your Miranda rights, didn't you? Did I know them? Yes. I understood them, yes. All right. So they advised you that you had the right to remain silent, that anything that you said could be used against you, that you had the right to an attorney at any time. If you couldn't afford one, one would be provided to you. And they asked you whether knowing all of these rights you were willing to answer <coughs> their questions without a lawyer present, didn't they? Yes. And you signed it and said yes? Yes. And you said that you signed it saying this statement is signed of my own free will without any threats or promises having been made. Right? I believe it says that, yes. Then they asked you whether you have ever been in Miami. Uh, then I asked them to use the phone, and they still was ignoring me. So then I asked them what they wanted to talk to me about. And that's when they just went along and started asking me, hey, when you last time you been to Miami? When you been to Miami? And they asked me questions about that. And according to you, you lied to them. Yeah, I lied to them? Yes. Yeah, I guess you could say yes. So you sat there, basically, and you lied to them about whether you'd been in Miami, right? Yes. You lied to them about seeing or knowing or being around Jason Mitchell, right? Yes. You <coughs> gave them some story, like an alibi, about being at the movies or the Bell Tower movies with your family or your sister or your girlfriend or something, right? No, I never told them that. So you never said that? No. And they continue to talk with you for a while, right? Yes. They gave you breaks, didn't they? Did they give me breaks? That's right. They left the room, yes. They gave you breaks, didn't they? Yes, they left the room. There was a phone on the table in that room, wasn't there? There was no phone. They offered you food, right? No. No? No. They gave you food before your formal statement, didn't they? Did they give it to me? Yes. Yes, they put it on the table. Isn't it true that when I asked you about this on June the 9th of 2011, you said that they only gave you food after the sworn statement? Yes, I actually do recall that. All right, so that's something else that you said under oath that was different, right? I actually misspoke. Well, what happened was you've seen the video, and you can see the food in there, and that's why you're saying something different now, isn't it? Is that why I'm saying something different now? Precisely. No, actually, when I was on the stand, I actually thought about it, because at the time, that's when you was talking real fast, and you was asking me something about... You were saying something about, was it before this statement or that statement, this statement? Then I had to answer him. You yes. talked... Okay, go ahead. Are you finished? Yes, I'm done. You stated earlier that you talked to, uh, had some discussion with Officer Walsh on the scene. On the scene? Yeah, you know, where you were first stopped. Oh, the traffic stop, yes. All right. When you were asked on June the 9th of 2011, at page 157, didn't you say, question, line 14, so then you went back and talked to Officer Walsh, answer, I didn't talk to Officer Walsh, question, you're saying that you never spoke to Officer Walsh at all, answer, no, question, Officer Walsh never uttered any words to you whatsoever, answer, never, so that's what you said then, right? Do you want to take a look at it? It's on page 158. About what? Yeah. When I asked you about it a couple of years ago, which would have been closer to the event, you denied having any discussion with Officer Walsh, didn't you? Maybe. Possibly.
Well done. One fifty seven. So it starts, we could start at uh, line 14. So then you went back and talked to Officer Walsh. I didn't talk to Officer Walsh. You're saying that you never spoke to Officer Walsh at all. Answer, no. Officer Walsh never uttered any words to you whatsoever. Answer, never. That's what you said under oath on June the 9th of 2011, correct? That's what it says, yes. And you sat through the testimony um, here today, you know, this past week or so of all the witnesses, right? Yes. And now you're saying something different, right? Now I'm saying something different? That's right. I mean, at the time, I probably didn't know who Walsh was, but I recall. Well, before you uh, testified on June the 9th of 2011, Officer Walsh had testified. At a hearing, at that hearing, hadn't he? He had testified? That's right. Yes, he testified differently from what he testified today, but, well, last week, but yes. Well, that's nice of you to say, but you did listen to Officer Walsh testify before you had an opportunity to answer on June the 9th of 2011, right? Before I could stand? That's right. Just as during this proceeding, you had an opportunity to listen to all the witnesses at a hearing. Okay of some kind, you had an opportunity to listen to everyone. So you had an opportunity to listen to everyone before they spoke the last time, right? Yes, I listened to them. So you said earlier that Detective Segovia started raising his voice to you. Yes. Is that right? Knocking over chairs? I mean, I believe one chair fell over, but the other one just slid. Now, outside, this is a conference room that you're sitting in, isn't it? It's a relatively large room with a large conference table. I mean, it's a room. The table basically takes up the whole room. There are blinds that go out to the outside area, right? Uh, yes, I believe so, yes. And there are people milling around everywhere out there, aren't there? There are people? Sure, there are like police officers from different agencies walking around out there. Aren't there? There's a lot of police, yeah. And it's your testimony that Detective Segovia, who's out of his jurisdiction, away from Miami Dade Police Department, is yelling at you and knocking over chairs when there are people milling around outside. The County Sheriff's Department, Fort Myers Police Department, Florida Department of Law Enforcement. Is that what you're saying? Yes, that's what happened. Didn't you say at the end of your sworn statement that no one ever threatened you in any way? No one ever threatened me? That's yes, right. Yes, I said no one ever threatened me. And you said that on your own, didn't you? Yes. Objection to our so even though you said here today that Detective Next question, Ruben. And you said that the detective Segovia said to you that goons from Miami were coming to get your family. Isn't that what you said the last time we discussed this in June of 2011? Did I say we're goons? Yeah. I know, yeah, he said something like that. He said people. Well, you said goons, and we talked about the word goons for a while in uh, the last hearing, didn't we? I don't really recall. It's possible.
For example, I said to you on page 168, did he apologize before or after he... All right. Isn't it true on page 160? Just say the page. Page 168. Line 19. Question. Can we go sidebar this, Judge? At some point, uh, no, they yes. How long were you alone? Weren't you alone for a while after you walked out of the room? For a while? Yeah. There wasn't no hour in 20 minutes. How long were you, according to you, alone in the room? According to me, every time they left, there was only a couple minutes in between. There wasn't no 20 minutes, no 30 minutes, no hour breaks. It's always they left, they came back. I was asking about my yes. And at some point, Jason Mitchell comes by. Right? Yes, at some point. So Jason Mitchell walks by, and Detective Harmon says he walked him by. Why didn't you tell him to shut it off? Right? Harmony? Yeah. There was two, two people. I believe one of them was Bellevue and the other one. I don't really. Well, Bellevue's in the room with you, isn't it? At that time? Yeah. No. Nope. You sat through the... Okay. So two officers walked by with Jason Mitchell, right? Two officers, yes. And they told you Buddy's telling us everything, right? They wasn't really speaking to me. They were speaking to Segovia. All right. So they said that right in front of you. So you knew at that time that Jason Mitchell was there. Right? Yes, I knew it was there at that point. And you believed at that point in time that Jason Mitchell was talking to the police, didn't you? I knew it was possible. And you knew that Jason Mitchell would know, based on his own personal knowledge, that you were at the home of Sean Taylor that night. Didn't you? You knew that, didn't you? That he could say I was there? That's right. You knew that Jason Mitchell was in a position to tell the police what he knew about what had happened at Sean Taylor's house. I knew he could say I was there, yes. And you hadn't said anything to the police about being there before then, had you? No. Shortly after that, you said you called Charles Wardlow, right? Shortly after that? Yeah. It was after that, yes. 
You said you called Charles Wardlow to ask him and go ahead and say that you did it, right? Isn't that what you testified to earlier? Yes, I told him to tell him I did it. You told Charles Wardlow to tell the police that you shot Sean Taylor. Yes. And this was even before you had told the police that you shot Sean Taylor. This was before? That's right. Is yes, you was. told the jury earlier? Yes, it, it was before. It was like right before, yes. You did shoot Sean Taylor, didn't you? No, I did not. You told Charles Wardlow, who you say did not even go into the house, to tell the police that you shot Sean Taylor before you even shot, uh, told the police that you shot Sean Taylor. Is that your testimony? Yes, that's what happened. I didn't say I shot Sean Taylor, I said tell him I did it. That was my exact words. You wanted Charles to tell the police that you were responsible, right? Yes. You were already cooperating with the police by then, right? Cooperate with them? That's right. No. So all of this happens at right around 2 o'clock or before 2 o'clock, doesn't it? I would love Yeah. You're calling Charles Wardlow and telling him to go ahead and tell the uh, police that you did it. Yes, this happened probably uh, right before 2. All right, so you got your Miranda rights at 156. <coughs> I beg your pardon, 11.56, and by 12, uh, 2 o'clock or before that, you're calling somebody who was uh, in the police station saying, tell them that I did it. Yes. So why did you do that? Why did I do that? Yeah. Because at that point, I just didn't care. It just, we going to go in, just tell them I did it, cooperate with them, and that way I could probably use the phone. Because at that point, I really wanted to find out what's going on with my mom. So even though you have signed uh, an initial statement saying no one ever threatened you or coerced you in any way, and the statement is completely free and voluntary, you're telling Charles Wardlow to say that you did, right? Yes, I told him to say I did. And you're identifying Tim Brown by 210, right? I identified him. So the longest the police could possibly have talked with you, if they stayed in the room the entire time, would have been two hours, right? Before you confessed that you shot Sean Taylor. Before I told him I did it? That's right. That two hours, yes. In fact, by 2.15, you personally hand drew this sketch showing where you were. And the layout of the when you shot Sean Taylor. Did I draw it? You personally drew it. You've already told us that, didn't you? Yes, I drew it. Including the inside of the house. The inside? That's right. Yes, I drew I drew the diagram. You drew where the door was kicked in? Did I draw where the door was kicked in? That's right. Uh, I believe so, yes. You drew where you were standing when the door was kicked in? I drew where I was standing when the door was kicked in? Sure. Uh, possibly, I think. I don't know. I got to see it. I drew the diagram. This can't really tell what it says now, but. You were in the house, weren't you? I was in the house? That's right. 
moves out of the house. You're calling uh, Charles Wardwell to tell him to say that you you did it, right? That day? Yeah. Yes, I told Charles to tell him I did. So you must have been calling him because Charles hadn't said anything yet, as far as you knew, right? As far as I knew, yes. And then Jahunt wasn't even picked up yet, was he? Was he picked up? Benja Hunt wasn't even picked up yet. At that time, I didn't know that. You know that now. Do I know that now? Yes, I know that now. You know that now, don't you? Yes, I know that now. And they hadn't talked to Tim Brown yet, right? Yeah, I know that now, too. So, Mr. Rivera, you said five people went to the house with Sean Taylor, right? Five people? That's right. five, yeah. Five and five. And the police want you to be the one to say that you're the shooter. Is that what you're saying? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah. Of the five people, they singled you out on November the 30th at like 12 o'clock in the morning or 11.30 in the morning to say that you were the shooter. That's what they did, yes. Of all those people. Of all those people? Even before Charles Wardlow had talked to them and said what happened, right? Even before Charles Wardlow? That's right. 
Ya sao sung sao yes. So without even talking to Charles Wardlow and finding out what Charles Wardlow had to say, these people wanted you to commit to something that was not true. You that you say is not true. Yes, they came to Fort Moss saying that that's what was happening. They asked you what kind of uh, rental car it was. You didn't tell them the truth about that, did you? I didn't tell them the truth. That's right. Yes, I didn't tell them. That's because why? Why? Who are you protecting then? Romaine? I wasn't protecting nobody. <laughs> why didn't you tell them? Because they didn't know. They didn't say nothing. I didn't want to bring nobody else's names involved. So you told them there was a plan to go and get money. Was that true? I told him there was a plan? Yes. Yes, I told him that's what, yeah. How much money were you looking for? How much money they was looking for? Right. I believe they were saying anywhere from 100000 200000 That's a lot of money, isn't it? Yes, it's a lot of money. Is that enough money to drive two and a half hours to Miami for? You told them you drove, right? Yes. So of all the people who could possibly, you went ahead and told them that you shot Sean Taylor, didn't you? I told them that, yes. Why did you feel it was necessary then to tell them that you drove? What difference would that make? Why well, I felt necessary to tell them I drove? Yes. Basically, we, I told them what they told me, what they thought happened. We went over it. Okay. So you're saying that they insisted that you say that you drove? They insisted? Yes. That's what they say they knew happened. Well, that is what happened, isn't it? No, it's not what happened. They seemed to know what happened, didn't they? They seemed to know? Yes. They seemed to know details, yes. So are you saying that uh, they asked you to say that Tim was next to you in the front passenger seat? That was so important to them? Did they ask to say that Tim was in the passenger seat? That's right. I mean, we had a discussion for like an hour about what happened. Yeah. <coughs> so they insisted that you say that? I wouldn't say they insisted, but they were saying this is what we know happened. Based on the stuff that we know, this is what we know happened. So, they made you say, for example, that the side you went in was by the boat. The side I went in was by the boat? Yes. Did they make me say it? Yeah. That's what they say happened, yes. So, all these statements that we're just talking about now, these are all, you know, from what I understand from you right this second, you lying under oath because you think it would benefit you or somebody close to you. Is that right? Did I think it would, I definitely think it would benefit me. To lie under oath, you mean? The lie no? That's right. At that time. What about now? What about now? Yeah. Would it benefit me? Yeah. To what? What do you think? The lie? Yeah. Um, it could benefit me. It's an uncomfortable position, but. So is that a yes? Is it a yes it could benefit me? Yeah. It could benefit me to tell the truth, yes. Could it benefit you to lie? That's the question I asked you. I don't know. But it's possible. How old are you now? Um, 23. And where the crowbar came from, did you tell them the truth about that? Did I tell them the truth about the crowbar? Yeah. Um, Possible. Did they tell you they knew where the crowbar came from? Did they know where the crowbar came from? Yeah. Um, I doubt that. All right, so you told them something that they didn't know. It came from the back of your house. So sometimes you tell them 
the truth. Sometimes you tell them things they don't know. Sometimes you say you tell them things that they told you, right? Yes, I basically, basically we had the conversation for probably like an hour or so about what happened. I was asking him what they heard happened. He was telling me what he heard. And I was basically putting stuff in based on what I knew. Well, if they hadn't told you anything, you knew a lot, didn't you? I knew a lot. That's right. I knew what I'm saying now, yes. If you call it a lot. You told them that Charles heard the voice, didn't you? Charles heard the voice? I believe so, yes. And that's true, isn't it? That Charles heard the voice? Yeah. No, it's not true. So they hadn't even talked to Charles yet. And they're telling you, bless you, that you've got to say Charles heard the voice. Objection they telling me i got to say Charles heard the voice? Yeah. They'll tell me that's what they believe happened. Well, well, you're saying, well, he know that's happened. He know these things happen. Did they tell you where Sean Taylor's room was? Did they tell me where his room was? Yeah. Uh, they showed a diagram. I don't believe it. I don't believe it said it was Sean Taylor's room or not. Though. You drew the diagram. I drew the diagram? Yes, I drew one too, yes. So now you're saying they showed you a diagram? Did they show me a diagram? Well, you just uttered that. You've never said that before, have you? I never said that before. You've never said that today before. I believe I did. Where did I get the gun? Yes. I never had the gun. You said during your sworn statement that you got the gun from your cousin George. Yes, I told him that. That was a lie? Yes. Did they tell you that you should say that you got it from your cousin George? Did they tell me that? Yeah. No, they was just telling me that we know you had to get it from somewhere. And they kept asking, where did you get it from? Where you get it from? And I so just that's made the name saying. up. Go ahead. And I just made the name up, George. So that's during the sworn statement? That during the sworn statement? Yeah. It was before the sworn statement, I told So they're asking, they're asking you where you got the gun from? Yes, right. they were basically telling me, hey, we know you got it from somewhere. Where did you get it from? 
why didn't you say it wasn't your gun, that you didn't have the gun? I was telling him that. I was telling him I had nothing to do with it at all. But at that point, I already had agreed. I agreed to cooperate with him, and that's what I was doing. We basically was having a conversation. So there's no misunderstanding. By the time your father got there, you were already completely cooperating with them. In fact, you were calling people like Charles Warbo. Isn't that true? Was I cooperating with him? Yeah. At that point, I think I was, I guess you could say I was done. And you went on to tell them where you had the gun while you were walking through the house, didn't you? Uh, I believe that's after them that. So you explained to them in great detail where you had the gun, anything and everything that you did that was on videotape, the videotape that you personally saw, right? Yes, I see it. And you're saying that you just remembered all of that based on the discussion that took place off the top of your head while it was being uh, videotaped at 3.55, is that right? Did I just think of all of that? Yeah, just remembered all of that. It was just based on the knowledge I had from hearing them talk about it, based on the knowledge of what he was saying, it was a combination, and I remember it. At the end of the statement, you swore that it was true, didn't you? I swore it was true? Yes, <coughs> you did, I didn't believe. you? They asked me, was it true? I said yes. And it was true, wasn't it? Was it true? Mm -hmm. No. So you lied under oath? Yes. And then you had a chance to talk to your father for a while, didn't you? A while? Yes. I talked to him. Yeah. 30, 30 yeah. minutes or so. And you still went ahead and met with the police again at 2 o'clock in the morning and signed and initialed that entire statement under oath saying that it was true, right? I signed an initial saying it was true? That's right. <coughs> didn't you? No, I didn't. No. On page 29, where it says, everything is true and correct. Has anyone threatened you or coerced you in any way possible? You said no. Didn't you? Yes, I said that at the time on the video. And you also initialed here on page 29 after you had an opportunity to review all of that, didn't you? After I reviewed it? Yes. You asked me about when I reviewed it later that night, early in the morning? Yeah, 2.15 in the morning, after you talked to your father. They wasn't asking me, was it true? They was just saying that you see anything misspelled because I guess usually they misspell things. And they'll just say, sign your signature after each page. What's this said? And I was, basically, I just signed it saying, yes, that was said. Well, didn't you sign an affidavit that says, Eric Rivera, who after being duly sworn upon oath, deposes and states that he is the witness in the foregoing statement, pages 1 through 29, that he was given the opportunity to make any changes corrections or deletions and that that statement is true and correct. I don't recall it, but if I signed it, I guess I've seen it. Do you see it now? Yeah, I see it. And you did it in duplicate, right? Uh, you did it on two different documents. I don't recall. It was like one, two o'clock that next morning. I had been up all uh, day, all tired. So, but this is possible. Not, this is not the first time you and I have discussed this, is it? Oh, uh, it's possible we could have discussed that at last hearing. Now let's talk a little bit about the letter. You did send that letter, didn't you? Yes, I signed it. So you sent a letter to your cousin. Jairus Bryce, right? Yes. Telling her, telling him that you wanted him to get to Ariel Boston and get her to change her testimony. 
and tell a story that you wanted her to tell, right? To tell what I want her to tell? That's precisely right. Basically, I want her to tell what she testified to, basically. You said Ariel's statement is the only one that's going to hurt the worst because she's seen us all together that night. That's what you said, right? Yes, at the time, that's really the only thing I was really concerned about because I had no connections to the other three guys and I felt like I had nothing to do with it. So I felt the only thing y'all were going to be able to use at the trial was her statement saying she's seen me with them because she's like the only person that could have said that. So you asked your friend Jairus and cousin to get her to not tell the truth, right? I was telling her not to say what she was saying, yes. Well, what I assumed she was saying at the time. Well, you're already referring to Ariel's statement here in your letter. And this letter is written in May of 2008 when you're over 18 years of age, right? May, yes, I was over 18. All right. And in fact, the letter says... Since they picked up Tim, Ariel's statement is the one that's going to hurt the worst, right? I can't resolve it. Remember that verse, but it says it, yes. So you want her, when she comes to court in front of a group of people, to say the story that you want her to say, right? Yes, I basically just want her to say that, yes. She's seen us there, but... That was basically it. You knew that if she said that she saw you with all of those people, that you were one of them, you were part of it, it was obvious, and you knew that that would hurt in court, didn't you? No, I knew that she said she heard me saying that I was involved. I knew that would hurt. All you say here is that you want her to tell some story about her seeing you together that night. That's what you personally hand wrote, isn't it? Well, you actually only read one letter. We was kind of writing each other. He was basically telling me what he heard. It was an ongoing conversation, basically. So you tell uh, your friend Jairus to get Ariel to say something that isn't true, correct? That wasn't true? Yeah, you tell Ariel to say the story I want her to say. Isn't that what you said in the letter, yes or no? Yes, if he says that, yes, that's what I said. I wrote the letter. You said, cuz, you just handle Ariel ASAP and I'll be straight. Right? Judge, he's saying he wrote her name, but it's not impeachment. I'm talking with him. I'm talking with him about it. In fact, you feel that if you can just get rid of Ariel, you've already got an alibi. That's what you wrote in the letter uh, in May of 2008, right? I feel like you asking the question, there was a lot of stuff going on at that time. I'm asking you what you wrote. Isn't it true, yes or no, that that is what you wrote in that letter? Handle Ariel, I already have an alibi. Yes, I was planning on trying to use the alibi. Then you got the cell site records, right? Cell site records? That's right. The ones that uh, Randall Thompson talked about? Uh, I doubt I have cell site records. Well, actually, I have. Well, you read police reports. At that time, yes, I read police reports. And the letter got found, right? They found yeah. the letter. They got it, yes. And so now you say that your statement was coerced and false, right? It was coerced and false? Yeah. Well, now firstly, I say it's not true, but okay. the term coerced is something I just really learned about. So, yes, I would say that too. But back in May of 2008, you were saying, get rid of Ariel, I'll have an alibi, right? Right, yeah. But again, the letter was found. So you also go on to tell your cousin, Jairus, to tell Ariel 
to make sure you all let her know that if she don't go through with this, she'll be fucking on your people life, and you're going to fuck hers. So that's what you said five months roughly after you were arrested in this case, right? Yes, I said so. Possibly I said something like that. And you went on to say, tell her to call and change her statement, right? Tell her to say she was just going with rumors. That's what you said, right? Yeah, at the time, that's what I believe she was doing. You also say that you're worried that Tim will turn state first. Same objection to the jury committee. In your lap, don't you? I say that. You did, didn't you? Yeah, I felt like something was going on. He was still out. He just got picked up. At the time, I thought. So you were worried that Tim Brown would say what really happened. No, right? I was worried about Tim Brown say the same thing Benjamin Hunt told you. In fact, you go on to say Benjamin telling everything, don't you? Benja telling everything? Isn't that what you say in the letter? Yes, I'll tell Benja telling everything that we discussed, yeah. And at the end, because you know what you're really saying in this letter, you instruct your cousin to burn it, don't you? Yes. Well, that's exactly what you did, didn't you? Yes, I wrote that. Isn't it true you have previously uh, stated in court that this statement is the truth, haven't you? This statement, this statement right here on the table, you've appeared in a courtroom under oath. There are other questions that I want to ask him about that. Isn't it true that you came to a hearing that you had a lawyer that you were sworn to tell the truth that your father was right outside of the courtroom and that you told the court that the statement was true? You did that, didn't you? Did I? Yeah, you did that, didn't you? Yes, I said in the court. You said it more than once, didn't you? Said it more than once? That's right. Um, I just recall you asking, was it true? And I said yes. And you had a lawyer, right? Yes, I had a lawyer. There was a judge there, right? Same judge, Murphy was there. And your father was right outside, right? Uh, I didn't know that, but... You knew your father was outside because he had just appeared and testified right before you, right? Right? Did he testify for me? Same. Right. Yeah, I believe so, yes. You said that you had told your father that you had confessed to the crime, right? I told him that I confessed? Yes. I told him that I told him I did it, yes. And you told him that you shot him, but you didn't mean to kill him, correct? I told him that? Yes. Uh, I don't recall saying that. Do you have page 175 of your transcript? Mm -hmm. 
starting at line 9. What did your father tell you? He just asked me what was going on, and I told him I had confessed to the crime. Question. All right. So you told him that you admitted to Detective Segovia that you killed Sean Taylor. Answer, yes. Did you tell him that you shot him, but you didn't mean to kill him? Answer, yes. That's what you told him, right? He says that, yes. So that's what you said in court at the last hearing date, right? That's what it says, yes, I guess. So on that occasion, you said that the police did things they shouldn't have done to get you to give a statement, but it was true, right? That's what you said at that hearing. That's that, that. So in May of 2008, you said you had an alibi. Get rid of the Ariel Boston, right? May of 2008? Yeah. Yeah, the letter we just talked about. Oh, I didn't say get rid of her. I didn't get rid of her, but I in June of her. in June of 2011, the police were bad, but the statement was true, right? June 2011. Yeah, at the hearing. Right. And now you tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury that the police were bad and the statement was not true. That's what you're saying today, right? Yes. That's all the questions. All right, Mr. Jerry, we're going to take a 10 minute break. If you'll assemble where we're up next to we'll get back in here in about 10 minutes. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, just close your tablets face down on your chair and make sure you take all your personal belongings with you. We'll take a 10 minute break.